Okay, hey there. We we are so excited to dive into another episode of the Caitlin James podcast with my new friend Kelly, who I I am in this situation here because I saw actually my team saw this thread in the KJ Education Facebook group. They're like, there's someone in the KJ Education group that is shooting 90 weddings a year and people don't believe her. And I'm like, oh people. And I get I totally get it though. It's it's very impressive. What you have done and what you've built is what people want to understand. And a lot of people are struggling to book in this season. They really are. And um, and so I feel like what you represent to them is hope that this can be done. And I can build the dream. And I can do the next season. And I can get to the next level. And there's just so many questions. And so, Kelly, thank you for being here. Also, how do you pronounce your last name? <laughs> so it is pronounced Sepkowitz. It's so Polish. Yeah, I love it. <laughs> so, so Polish. I love it. That's why I'm Kelly C, because um, I like knew in my heart that if I went by my last name, that no one would ever find me. Right. <laughs> so we just why why did a little play. Yeah, we did a little play on it, um, and that is why I'm not Kelly Stubkowitz, but that's how it's pronounced. Yeah. You know what? That was an incredible branding decision. It really was. I um, I feel like whenever I see last names like that, I'm like, oh, I'm not even going to attempt it. I'm just going to call her Kelly C. That's all I'm going to call her. <laughs> Um, so I, so I heard, I heard about you obviously through that, um, thread that was in our Facebook group, but that the cool thing about that is that like, I have a lot to learn about you. Like I know from listening to Kyle's podcast that you were on, which was very good. It was super helpful, but you're in New Jersey. And I know cause a few minutes ago, I got to meet them. You have two precious fur babies. Yes. Yes. Um, you live in a house that's being remodeled, but it's really cool. It has great potential, but that's all I know. So tell me if you can your story in like a nutshell, because I think people need to understand like who you are and what your life looks like to understand yeah. how you do this. So, okay. Um, so I've been doing photography for 13 years. Um, which seems insane. And I will preface all of this by saying that for the vast majority of my 13 years, I was not in photography networking groups. I was not like talking to other photographers. So until fairly recently, I didn't really even know that what I have been doing is like controversial. <laughs> <laughs> just going to like preface everything with that. Um, what, would, what would you say is contra- just so people understand, what would you say people think is controversial? Just the sheer volume. The sheer volume Um, and the fact that I don't have an associate team and also the fact that I do edit every single wedding in-house person. I mean, I have to tell you, I, I'm shocked by that. (laughs) (laughs) And, And this is, you know, it didn't happen overnight. I actually like before we, um, you know, got on, I pulled so, and I'm going to tell, I'll tell a little bit about my story. Um, But this was how I used to keep track of my weddings back in 2012. My dog is squeaking her toy like crazy, that awful noise. And it's okay. Um, So when I was, I used to work a full-time job. I was working nine to five as a librarian. Um, And I actually worked in libraries for 10 years. Wow. Um, So some people think, um, because librarian, it tends to also be like a passion career Mm -hmm. where, you know, you have to go get a master's to be a librarian. Like it's a whole thing. Um, but actually, initially, I was uh, going to school for um, political science. So when I originally you know, went to college, I did poli-sci. I wanted to be a defense attorney. Um, so wow. I went kind of on a law track. I was very into that. I was originally going to go to law school. And when I was in college, I <laughs> quickly realized that I was not, um, I wasn't really passionate about law in the way that I thought that I was. Yeah. Um, I had a lot of like moral misgivings about it. The more that I went through it, the more that I took classes. So it kind of became, um, you know, clear to me towards the end of my undergrad that I was not going to go to law school, Mm -hmm. um, just because I didn't think I was going to be happy doing that. So it put me in a very awkward career position because I had this degree um, and political science isn't great for anything except, <laughs> <laughs> true, true. except for, you know, law. And it wasn't even my pick, which is funny, um, because the, the college that I had gone to, that was really one of the only programs that you could do if you were interested in law. Um, oh, wow. 
there's not, yeah, they didn't have like a law undergrad. So it was just a whole host of things. And I, I actually believe that now, like if you went to the same school, they have a, like an actual law program. But back then that was like the degree that you had to get in order to pursue law. Okay. Um, so I ended up with this very strange degree that I really couldn't use for very much aside from, you know, what I wasn't going to do anymore. Right. Right. So I ended up being a temp at a library and I liked it. Yes. And at that point, I really had no career direction. I was like working in food service. I worked in an ice cream parlor for 10 years. I waitressed. Um, so I was very much like in the hospitality, you know, industry at that yes. point. And what's your, um, what's your age at this point? Because I know you're, are you 38? 38. 38. Okay. But, but during this season, you were like 20 something? <sighs> yes. So okay. when I first started at the library, I think I was, it was 20. 08, maybe 08 okay. or 09. Yep, yep. Um, so I was working there, you know, and I decided to just make a go of it because the the benefits were good. Like the money wasn't really great. At the time, it seemed really great. It wasn't really great, spoiler. Yeah. yeah. Um, but I went through a whole master's program. Um, wow. I actually did the whole thing online in, I think, a year and a half. I accelerated it just to get it done. Wow. I felt so far behind the eight ball at that point um, because... I, I felt like I just wasted four years. I mean, it was just, it was yes. a rough time. Yes. Um, oh. So I felt like I had wasted, you know, four years pursuing this degree that I now wasn't going to use. No law school. <laughs> felt like I disappointed my family. Oh, it's um, hard. It's so hard. <laughs> but so I ended up in libraries and I went full time. So I had a full time library job. I, when I quit, I had 10 years in. Wow. Um, That's a when, long time. Yes. Yes. It, you know what? It, it didn't feel that long, um, at that time in my life, but looking back on it, it, it was a decade. It was a whole decade. Um, but as I was working at the library, um, I did have an interest in photography. So it started out just like, I feel like for a lot of us, it starts out, we're doing like landscapes and going to the beach. It's like seagulls and seashells and like, oh, this lighthouse. And yeah. um, <laughs> it was, a, you know, just a fun thing that I used to do. I did like in the beginning, very overcooked HDR photos. Oh, of that- course. Didn't we all? <laughs> I think we all did, but they were so, oh my gosh. When I pull those up, it's... Uh, some of them aren't terrible, but I, I am a little embarrassed when I go oh, look at oh, those. Of course, of course. Because then you, of course, have to put people in them. And HDR is not for people. Yeah. Um, no. So those early portraits were just very rough. Um, but I you know, started there. And yeah. then eventually, because Craigslist was a thing at that point, I posted yeah. on Craigslist that I was looking to do a family portrait. And I ended up doing a family portrait. Yeah. And I just fell in love with photographing people. Yeah. Um, it was almost like I did not care about landscapes anymore. And I don't think I have photographed truly a single landscape since I started doing portrait. It was just almost like it wasn't worth it to me anymore. Um, and I kind of like, I, I think it's more because I get very attached to the people. Um, I'm like, I'm very much into the people that I'm photographing and just getting to know them. And clearly you can't do that with a landscape. <laughs> yes. um, but it added an element of photography for me that I had been missing that I didn't really know that I was missing. Right. Um, and it's just, it's hysterical because sometimes I'll think, oh, I'm going to like bring my camera like on vacation and I'll take these really nice yes photos and we were in Rhode Island doing the cliff walk, which is so, so beautiful. Yes. And I'm standing there with my camera and I just was not inspired and it's gorgeous. This yes. place is, I mean, it was absolutely stunning. Um, and I just knew I was like, and this was only a couple years ago, but I was like, yep, no, I'm definitely a portrait photographer. Yes. <laughs> I I don't so, care. That's so good to know. Like it's such a gift to know, like, Hey, I can feel where the passion is. And a lot of people, I think, would love to feel that and to <sighs> know, like, yeah, this is, they hear my voice. They hear my voice. They're like, who is that? <laughs> who is that lady? Um, but so, okay, so um, when was your first wedding? Uh, it was 2012. Um, okay. And I will say, because I was looking at my little sheet. So yeah. this sheet was part of a notepad that I had when I was working at the library. And this was like, I used to write down every wedding that I was shooting, like the couple's names, the location. Um, and wow. this went on for a few years. So I can literally tell you how many weddings I shot year by year, starting in 2012. <laughs> that is, you know what that is? That's your first CRM. That's your- <laughs> It was. <Yeah>. That- <laughs> 
<laughs> that was the first CRM. And was. you know what's funny though? I feel like in 2012, and I started in 2011, like with family. So 2011, 2012, I don't even know if there really like were CRMs in the way that we know them now. Oh no, I I don't think I don't think there. I had one back then, but it was one of the few, and it was clunky. It was very clunky. Right. So I, you're right. I don't think it, nothing exists like what we have now, but. It was it was definitely like a spreadsheet situation, you yes. know, <laughs> or, or a notepad situation, which is just amazing. And so you shot your first wedding while how many years did you work full time in a library and yeah. you were shooting weddings? So I was working full time and still shooting weddings from 2012, 13, 14, 15, 16, 17, like it's seven years. Yeah, it's a long um, time. Long time. And my very first wedding um, was the day before Hurricane Sandy hit. <gasps> wow. <clears throat> so that added, and <laughs> so many, so many things. Um, but I remember everything was closing because New Jersey, and particularly my area, was ground zero for Hurricane Sandy. <sighs> Oh my gosh. Ground zero, Ortley Beach, which is, so I'm like on the bay side here. Ortley Beach, which is directly across the bay, was ground zero. It was annihilated. Like the Jetstar roller coaster that was in all of those iconic Sandy images yes. is 20 minutes away wow. from where I am. Wow. So we knew that it was going to be bad, um, you know, the evening before Hurricane Sandy. And I remember thinking, <laughs> if I don't go tonight, there was a very real chance that I wasn't going to be able to get home just because they oh were closing God. everything. Like they were oh. closing everything. Things were flooding. Um, the wedding was in Spring Lake, which was, I think already like the water was like, it was just a very bad situation. So stressful. It's so very stressful. stressful. And I remember thinking like, uh, but if, but if I don't go, then they won't have wedding photos. And this is the first thing that I'm photographing. And if I don't go to this <laughs> wedding, um, they're not going to have these pictures. So we did get a couple outdoor pictures with umbrellas. Yes. Um, the place where I did the wedding is under a different name, but I still shoot there sometimes. Yes. Um, as a prep location, I haven't shot like a full event there in a while. It's very small. It's like a bed and breakfast. Yes. Yes. Um, but just that that whole time, um, and that was my first really experience in weddings, and wow, it was very intense, very yes. very intense. So you're just like, am I? Is this really going to be a thing? And and yeah. look at you now, like shooting. Okay, what when when people when people see that you shoot like ninety plus wedding, like when did that start? When did because my biggest year was forty eight, and <sighs> I about died. <laughs> <laughs> um, and I didn't have any kids at the time, so that was mm -hmm. helpful, um, which I think whatever I tell people, like I shot 40, 48 weddings a year, and we did triple headers, and um, I do have to tell them, like, I I didn't have children that I had to go home and care for the next day, or that night, or or nurse to sleep, like that, that wasn't a part of my life, so it's, I think it's what's really important is to paint a picture for people of, like, what your reality is, because some people see what you do, and then they... <laughs> make really funny, interesting comments. And it's based out of their own reality, you know? So when did the 90, when did the massive years start? So I will tell you on my little sheet here. So oh, yes. 2012, I photographed two. Um, and Hurricane Sandy was in late October. Yes. So that first year, and of course, my poor cousin's wedding that I was supposed to be in was Three days after Sandy hit, no, um, no. So she, her venue was gone, Caitlin, her venue was gone. Um, and so we went down to a different venue that was able to just host a very small number of us. They, at the last minute, like it was further inland and they still had power. So we went down there and I technically counted that I shot her wedding, but yeah. I really didn't. Yeah. Um, <laughs> I was supposed to be a bridesmaid. <laughs> We went out on the golf course and we photographed, like we did some pictures and that was that. Uh, um, so 2013, I did seven. Okay. 2014, I did four. So I tell people often that the trajectory is not... Um, it's not it, a, a it linear... It be no. like this. Yes. Um, and I had some other... I don't want to say I had some other problems at that time, but I definitely had a branding issue. I had a consistency issue. I had a style issue. And, you know, of course, when you're first starting your business... It's almost like it's hard to be honest with yourself about those things. Mm -hmm. um, you know, we all think like, oh, I'm not shooting this HDR anymore. Um, I you must know, be I'm fine. Really fine. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yes. So, 
you know, we had some ups and downs there. So 2014 was four. 2015, I shot seven. Okay. Um, 2016, I did six. And 2016, I consider to be my turnaround year. Okay. So 2016 was when I got serious. Um, that was when I started to really brand the business. Mm -hmm. That was when I felt like... Um, what I was photographing, I was actually being intentional and consistent about the light that I was using, things that I were doing. I mm -hmm. really just kind of buckled down and I, I felt like I got in a better mindset even. Yeah. Um, and I just got serious about it because I loved it. And the years that were kind of up and down, um, I just knew that if I kept with that type of inconsistency, that it wasn't I never had a plan to be full time, um, like which full is, transparency. Which is so funny when you look at your reality now. <laughs> yep, never had planned that. Um, the job that I had, even though it was low paying, had excellent medical benefits. Um, you know, I had decent PTO for what it was. There were a bunch of things that really made it a career choice. Yes. Um, and something that I had not anticipated leaving. Um, but in 2016, I got serious about like the, the weddings and the photography just because I figured if I'm going to do this, even part time, I should be serious about it. Like, right. you know, it had been kind of a struggle up to that point. Just <laughs> I was taking like, you know, weeks to edit a wedding. Um, yes. Stressful. Which so, is so, <laughs> that is interesting because I think it's helpful for people to hear that you had these years of like you, you know, you shot seven and you shot four. It's like, well, what happened there? It's like, well, yeah, it. Well, there was a turning point for you. And I'd love, I want you to continue with your timeline, but I'd love to go back to after, you, after your timeline about like, what would you say were like key markers that made 2016? I mean, you mentioned some of them, but like, I, I want to go back to that eventually because I think a lot of people are looking for their turnaround year. And I think I know what you're going to say, um, but, and it's going to be hard for people to hear. <laughs> it's, probably, it's probably rooted in like, really crazy hard work and consistency. Like that's, that's what makes this happen. And, um, so, okay. So 2016, but then what happened in 2017? So then 2017, I shot 16. Um, 2018, I did 42. Wow. Wow. And still working full time. Wow. Um, and then yes, 2019 was the year that I had left and I did 45. Um, wow. So that was, you know, what the, what the trajectory was. Yeah. And you are absolutely right. 2016, I wish, and sometimes people, you know, it happened in your group. It happened in Kyle's group. I, um, the way that people phrase the question is almost like I can give this one piece of advice and it will be the magic advice and it will help you to book yeah a lot of weddings yes. and there's, there's really no one thing. Um, and a lot of what I have done is like really work. Um, yeah, really like just hours of work and, you know, being committed to hours of work. Yeah. Um, and it got easier over the years, you know, like, um, at first, like I said, it was taking me, I think my first wedding I delivered 250 images. Yeah. 2023, I, I shot, I think 92, I think 92 or 93. Oh my God. Um, 20, <gasps> 2022, I did, I want to say like 88, um, oh. probably 86 or 88. Um, and then 21 or 21, I did 79. Wow. 22, so that, I did. <laughs> that's, con that's, I mean, it's kind of a consistent growth pattern there. Yeah, 20, yeah, 22, I did 93. I'm sorry, yes, 20, 22, 93, 23, 92. Um, and I will be completely honest, once you hit these higher numbers, a difference of six weddings isn't going to make or break you at that point. Yes. Um, I think that the turning point in workload probably happens more around that like 50, 60 mark. Mm -hmm. um, because then you're shooting, you're, you're photographing and editing like so frequently um, you know, that's when it starts to feel like a much heavier load at that point. But I feel like once you go over like 75, 80, a difference of 10 or so, right. like you don't even really, I don't say you don't notice it, but, yes. um, it just doesn't quite feel like this, yeah. that many extra. Well, I, that say, I say yes, but like, I've never gone past 48 and 48 was like, oh my, so this is what, this is my question. And I, I mean, I have this whole list, but, um, <laughs> I, what does, and there's no judgment here. I think the judgment that comes across in the Facebook threads is disbelief. It makes them worry like, what's wrong with me? I can't book 12. 
then there's some judgment about like, well, her life has to be just consumed with other people's weddings and other people's lives. What about her life? And I don't think that fully, some people might be judgmental, but I think some people are genuinely curious about like, what, how many weekends a month throughout the year do you have for your life and your relationships? Oh, absolutely. I, and you know, I'll be honest. So a large part of this is mindset. And I feel like if you have, and a lot of photographers have, so if you have worked a nine to five, like I had, you give up the vast majority of your time yeah. to that job. Yes. Um, and for a great many people, that is their reality. Um, you know, I, I still am involved, um, in a very, very limited way with the labor union that I was part of when I worked at the library. Mm -hmm. So I am still, you know, very much aware of what the situation is for everybody who works in that system, you know, labor wise, mm -hmm. financially, you know, a, a lot of different factors. Right. And, um, even recently I was doing the numbers with them about how many hours, you know, they work a week, they work Saturdays, they work Sundays. Um, you know, they have limited PTO, the PTO that they do have, they have to compete with other people for, like I used to compete with my fellow staff members to try to have time off. Wow. So that had been, you know, my reality for yeah. 10 years and you eventually acclimate to it. Right. Um, but it's, it's funny. Um, I was, I don't even watch TikTok, but there was someone recently who made a TikTok and she was crying, talking about how um, trapping a nine to five felt. And those feelings are valid. Yes, <laughs> um, and yes. that, it doesn't, those are valid feelings. And it doesn't mean that you don't want to work. It just means that you're aware that you're giving up a lot of your time. Like I used to yes. leave the house because I would go run before I went to the library. I would leave at 5.07. And I would go to the gym and I would come home, quickly shower, and then I would leave for work. And the parking situation was very difficult. So if I didn't get there at a certain time, like I would almost not find a spot for my car. So then I would sit in my car for a half hour. Wow. Um, you know, like just waiting to go into work. And then, you know, my, I would start at nine. And then by the time that I left my nine to five, like I would be done at five. And then I would hopefully be home for like 530, 545. Um, and that was five days a week, yeah. um, sometimes six days a week. Yeah. And that was that. Um, yeah. and, so, and, you're, and you're not making multi six figures, you know? No, That's I was making, and you know, sometimes like, cause I want to put the numbers into perspective. So yeah. I believe that my take home at the point that I left was 53,000, something wow. around wow. there. Um, and that was giving all of that time. Um, yes. And that is a very, like, and I just want to hammer it home. So that's a very <sighs> normal situation for a large part of the population. For many yes. of my clients, oh, that's the uh, type of life that they lead. Yes. So I, I, that is such a good point because I think what is so interesting is that, like, I hear you say that and I'm like, makes sense, right? You are making astronomically more and you actually have more freedom during your work week than you've ever experienced in your life. And so why would so this doesn't seem like this huge sacrifice, but I think the people that are commenting are also the people that went in and I think they're try you know well how do I want to say this? I think there are a lot of people who look at being a photographer and think, I want a different life and I want to live my life. I don't want to live for work. So I need to have weekends, Saturdays with my family. I want to have, because a lot of people, even if you're a photographer, your partner, your spouse, they have a nine to five. And so the weekends are still so precious. And so I just feel like it makes so much sense coming from your background and coming from the fact that you're involved with a labor union and like that you have I what I make up it could be wrong but is that you have a heart for that world and you understand and have empathy for the world of like people are working their butts off they don't have much life to live I'm killing it and working a lot of hours but like I know a lot of people work the same and make so much less so like your mindset is like it's not that bad guys it's 90 weddings a year sounds crazy but these other people who are photographers that are trying to find the balance and want the freedom. It's just a different perspective on what you want out of your life and a different perspective of where you're coming from. Because for me, for example, I've never worked a nine to five 
in my life, I don't even know how to apply for a job. I've always just created my own jobs. So for me, and this is such a good perspective because like I just posted a reel today and sometimes I feel guilty that like I'm not with my kids more, like some of these homeschool moms that like literally they, they just watch every developmental shift in their child. And my mom sees some of those shifts that I don't because she's with my children all day. And I feel guilty about that. But then you put it in perspective and you're like, I saw mom pick up a kid from a daycare the other week at 6.45 p.m. I had just dropped my daughter off at gymnastics, or I was picking her up, and I'm like, oh, my gosh, she hasn't seen her baby since 5 a.m., and she's going to go home and go straight to bed. That's their life. So I, my perspective is, gosh, I'm so grateful that I have the flex. I can go right up there and see my baby if I want to. And so for you, oh, my gosh, my computer's falling. Did you see that? <laughs> gradually getting closer to my face. Um I was like, what is happening? <laughs> this is the way it was supposed to be. <laughs> gosh. Oh, gosh. But anyway, so I, I feel your pers- – I think people need to understand where you're coming from and what you've been through and what you've experienced in life because if they don't understand that, then they go down this spiral of, like, judging you mm-hmm. for these choices. I mean, I do think it makes sense why you choose this. But I think one of the biggest questions, I put it in my VIP channel, Instagram thing, whatever that is. It's like th- more people can't join right now. I don't know why. But Instagram it, Instagram hates me. It's fine. Um, it hates me too. It's, I think Instagram hates everybody unless yeah. you give them a certain amount of money. <laughs> yeah. It's just like, yeah, you don't need our help. So we're going to – whatever. But, um, but anyway, people – someone said a standard business practice would see the demand – and the supply, and when your demand is so high, the natural business response is to say, okay, I'm going to limit the supply and make it more exclusive. So what I am assuming, it may be wrong, is that because of your past work experience and because you see other people working so hard for so little, that it makes sense for you to stay at a not average price point because you're at seven grand, is that right? So it's start, right now I'm starting at 59. I just raised my prices a little bit. I do a little bit well, at a time. That is, you know what, girlfriend? You could double your prices and get, I get it. You would cut, you'd probably only book 25 weddings at 15,000, but you'd, you'd make comparable money. So tell people why that, what holds you back from that? And maybe you don't ever want that, you know, which is fine. So I... And I mean, supply and demand, I do feel like is a real, I mean, obviously, and I was just talking about supply and demand because I feel like the supply and demand is a large part of why this year for many, many people has fallen off bookings wise. Yes. Um, I don't even think that there's a lack of couples per se. I think that we're just back more into 2019 levels because 2020 through 2023 was very falsely inflated with yes. Yes. incredible demand. And not enough supply um, just because there was a whole year that was lost. It was completely lost. Weddings got pushed forward one or two years. Um, I think even there were probably some people who were shooting in 2023 weddings that maybe were from 2020. Yes. Um, Oh, I definitely did that. So there was, there was a push forward. Um, so all of that crazy, like false demand has died and it fell back to 2019 levels. So you know, there's still couples getting married. I don't even necessarily believe that it's because, you know, people, I've heard so many theories now in the different groups. Yeah. Um, cause some people say like, oh, well they didn't meet in, um, uh, they didn't meet in 2020. So they're not getting married in 2024. Like there's a whole host of different, sure. um, different theories. I obviously were, I'm speculating. I don't really know, but, um, I do think, you know, that the, de- the demand has fallen off, but there is a glut of supply that exists right now that is making it difficult to book just because there's not the crazy demand. And I think that everybody on a whole has to work harder for the bookings that they do get just because there is like an oversupply right now. Yes, Um, yes, definitely. So I think that what's happening right now does have a basics, a basis in, you know, economics a hundred percent. Yes. Um, But my market here in New Jersey is incredibly, incredibly competitive. So there have always been a very high number of photographers. Now, the good news is that we also have a lot of wedding venues. That is true. Yes. Um, And we also have a whole lot of people because it's a tiny little state, but we are very overpopulated. Yes. Um, So 
but it, but it creates an interesting situation because I feel like because there is an abundance of supply in New Jersey and there always has been, um, I genuinely don't know. I mean, I know the market pretty well. If I could do something like jump up to a $15,000 price point, you know, from where I am right now and still continue to book the way that I have. Um, and I, <laughs> I'm going to go I'm, out on a limb and say, I think it's I very possible, but I think that it's another mindset shift. It's yeah. the, the shift that you got yourself to where you are now, which has served you incredibly well. That next shift is, I, and I think a lot of people you even mentioned on the other podcast episode that like, what if you go to that, that tier up and people that spend $15,000 on weddings, what if they're not as awesome at these, as these people, you know? And, they, and that might be true. I, it very well might be true. I have a great fit of client right now mm -hmm. and I get asked all the time, like, well, don't you get any bridezillas? Don't you get any? And honestly, my yeah. true like hands to my heart answer is <gasps> no. I get people who are an excellent fit for me, people that I love, people that I continue, you know, to talk to after their weddings. Yes. Um, and that has been true over the entire course of my career. Yes. Um, like I, I never feel like I'm getting, you know, or booking weddings that are like a bad fit for me. Yes. Um, and I, I do think that has to do with a, a couple of different factors. Um, and you, t it's something that you, you know, like you talk about, you, you, you know, the KJ people know these yes. things. Um, yes. yes. <laughs> they know they're aware. They yes. know. Yes. Yeah. Um, you have a tribe, you found your tribe of people and they love you and they trust you. And I heard you say on the other episode with Kyle, like you, people uh, ask, one of the main questions is what's your number one referral source. And when you said on the other episode, like uh, it's word of mouth, people tell people how they experienced me and how they loved me. And now like, and I think you even said on the episode again, like that some people have a, a gift in that and it comes so natural. And then some people really have to work for that. Um, and we talk about that in my posing course because, I mean, some people get frustrated with their posing course because they're like, I want more prompts. And I'm like, prompts aren't going to save you. You've got to learn. <laughs> you've got to learn how to be a people person. Like you've got to be able to look at a couple and be like, okay, that's his personality. That's hers. I'm going to have to speak this way to get him engaged. I'm going to have to do this pose to get her excited. But like, I got to be a people reader. I got to create this experience that makes people think like, I got to tell my best friend about KJ, you know, or not even like, I, and I'm sure you experience this too. We get to the bridal party. We go through bridal party without fail. Every single wedding, someone says on the bus ride somewhere or like getting off and going to the reception, someone mentions to me, you're great at this. Like you made us feel so comfortable. That is my marketing strategy. And I have a feeling it's yours too. Yes. Yep. Yes. And I sat on Kyle's podcast and um, I, I <laughs> it, it goes at odds saying this, but I don't feel like I'm that great of a photographer. Um, oh, yes, you are. Yeah, I, I, feel your like I'm all right. I feel like I'm all right. Um, but I feel like I'm very good at you know, figuring out the people that I'm with and what will make them, you know, comfortable and happy and also really putting them first. So, yeah. yes. um, you know, I don't, I don't photograph for me. I photograph for them. So even if there's something that I feel like would be really cool and look really cool, if I feel like it's going to make them uncomfortable, um, and everybody oh. has got like a sliding scale of what's going to make them yes. uncomfortable. Yes. Um, I could show you legitimately ah. terrible photos of me where I got directions that I was uncomfortable with. Um, <laughs> and you can totally tell, you can tell. You can totally tell. Things I didn't want to do, faces I didn't want to make. Um, so I try to be like acutely aware of the people that I am photographing and what's going to make them, them happy. Mm -hmm. Um, you know, mm -hmm. and I really play to that, even if sometimes it sacrifices like what would be in my portfolio or what would be, mm -hmm. you know, around just yes. because like, you know, their experience is so important to me. Yes. Um, and, and I, I feel, feel like, like that, that attack has like yes. that angle of, you know, doing things has been a large part of being successful for me. Yes. And I, I would say like, for example, example, one way that you do that, like thinking through what do they need that I think you do well um, on your Instagram account, having highlights that are saved. I think it, it looked like per location and per venue. Is that accurate? So people could mm -hmm. see kind of like, okay, I'm getting married here. I want to see what she shot, shot here, right? That is a very them focused idea. Is it, is it, you know, mind blowing? No, but a lot of people don't have that. Now you are shooting 
I'm assuming at a lot of venues on repeat. And so that makes sense that like you're kind of setting yourself up as the expert for these venues and have a whole highlight dedicated to it. Like, but that is thinking through if someone has booked for me, it'd be at, at Dover Hall, then if they came to my Instagram and I was okay shooting at Dover Hall, you better believe I'm going to be highlighting like I'm an expert at shooting there. And it's thinking about what people need to see in order to make them trust you. And it all comes back to like just putting yourself in your client's shoes, which I think another thing that you mentioned in, in Kyle's podcast that was so helpful um, was just t- letting people know that like you're okay with doing the hard work of getting people. And it's not just the bride and groom. It's everybody, you know, it's the vendors, it's the venue, it's, you know, and we talk about in KJ All Access, which I think you've been a member of at some point. Um, yes. Like talking about the way Michael meets the DJ and talks to him off to the side during like the light music that's playing. That is marketing for us. Like making sure everybody feels loved and cared for. Like that is a huge priority. And a lot of people are so worried about being viewed as the help or so worried about like, am I going to get my vendor meal? Or so worried about, like, it really is about them. But that's the culture we live in, right? We live in this me, me, me culture, like serve me, love me, make me feel important. And it makes sense why people are struggling with the service side because they want to be served first. So I feel like you got that right. And look what happened, you know? I would, it's, it's, I love that you said that. Um, we work in a service industry. Yeah. Um, you know, I don't consider myself an artist. I think I said the same on Kyle's podcast. It is true. I don't consider myself to be like this amazing artist. I, you know, first, firstly, I'm in a service industry and I serve couples on their wedding day. Um, and I do it through photos and yes, I want the photos to be beautiful. I want them to be consistent. I want the couples to get exactly what they saw in my portfolio. Right. Um, but they, they come first. Um, you know, I, I come like maybe fifth on that day, yeah, yeah. <laughs> maybe, maybe lower. It might be right. lower. Right. Um, but what the crazy part is, is that my couples take such, they care so much. Yes. Um, and I'm like, why are you like, I had this, the last wedding that I photographed like a week ago, um, so sweet. They had noticed on, um, Instagram that I was talking about like Entenmann's cake because sometimes when I come home from a wedding, I literally will eat Entenmann's cake over the sink. It is what it is. You know, I love it. I love to judgment, open a judgment for that. Um, but I had shared it on Instagram and I walk into prep and they had an Entenmann's cake for me. Um, and I almost cried. I think I did. I think I might've cried. Um, but they're just sweet, you know, like that's, that's the feeling of being known. Right. Which gets into a whole like don't get Caitlin James started on a personal brand. Like I I remember when I was shooting and this is horrible. Like I can't believe I drank this stuff. But Diet Mountain Dew in college for me. I didn't you know, like I didn't drink in college, but like Diet Mountain Dew is just as bad for you. So um but people would show up with gummy bears and Diet Mountain Dew. It's mm-hmm. no one like I'm surprised I didn't gain forty pounds. But I'm like so I remember thinking they know me and they love me and they 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 care about who I am as a person. And I, I do think that there are some people that think that they lose that if they raise their prices, if they go higher. Um, I am living proof that that's not true. I just am about to book a $14,000 wedding for a sister of a past bride, and they're so excited, and they're paying five grand more than their sister paid. Didn't even bat an eye. And their parents are the same parents. They're, you know, So I do think there's probably a lot of room for you to, if you wanted to raise and do less, but like, if you are happy doing what you're doing and you're, and you can support that kind of lifestyle. Um, but I, I do have questions about like how, when I heard you say <laughs> that you don't outsource your editing, I almost dropped a bowl of chicken <laughs> salad on the floor. Like I could not believe it. What does your life look like after, um, a, a double header weekend because you have to do a ton of double header weekends. I'm assuming. Oh, I do quad. Yeah, I do quads. Wow. Um, I actually, wow. I actually prefer to do quads because then I do have like this past weekend. I didn't have any weddings. I didn't have Friday, mm-hmm. Saturday, or Sunday. This coming weekend, I just have Friday, and then I'm I don't have anything Saturday or Sunday. So I prefer awesome. to do them in little blocks, honestly. Yes. Um, but I will say I do this. So when I'm at the wedding, I bring a laptop with me. Me and too. Me too. I do. <laughs> it's the smart thing to do. Yes. So I back up the images when I'm there, back them up to the laptop, and I do a same-day preview for them. Gotcha. Um, same-day preview used to be like three images. Now, oh my goodness, if I like – 
if it's been a day and I've, you know, it's been a really diverse and varied day, sometimes I'm doing like 40, 50 previews. Yes. But it only takes me like 20 minutes to do that. Um, Because you're shooting in consistent light. So it's like, because I'm picking, you know, really consistent things. I shoot in batches, like in groups when I'm like, I have a, a very specific system to how I'm photographing. Um, that I feel like I can replicate in pretty much any circumstance, Mm -hmm. which, um, you know, I think people hear that sometimes and they're like, but all weddings are different and they are, but you can have the same shooting approach throughout them. And that is the most important thing because it will really help your editing, you know, like going forward. So well, people want to know how, um, and I appreciate your honesty with all this because I think people need to have a realistic picture and, and they need to understand, you know, there's not some magical thing that you're doing that is, you know, creating this, this system where, like, you, you're, you are sacrificing time to do this. You're not shooting 90 weddings and you get to have, you know, two weekends off every single month, right? That's there's not yeah. possible. Um, you're not outsourcing. So you're coming home and, and you're having to spend a lot of hours on your laptop. There's no way around that. Um, but... You're also in a season of life where, you know, if if Buttercup will allow you to, <laughs> which I don't know if she will. Not, we don't know about that right now. Yeah, we are, we're not so sure. <laughs> but, if, but if Buttercup will allow you to have some good work hours, you can make this thing happen. And for a mm-hmm. lot of other people, it's just not, they don't have, that capacity does not. Oh, yeah. Them. So, okay. So we were, we were at... Um, where are we? Insta- you do your previews, which do I think 40 to 50. I love that because you're getting normally a collection from the whole day, you know? Yeah. Um, and, that, and they love that. Vendors oh, love yeah. that. It's, it's all encompassing a better idea for everybody. And I try to make, I mean, sometimes it's not possible to get reception in the preview, but I really make an effort. Like yeah. if I have to do a second little bit of preview when I'm eating, like when they put down the meals and whatever, mm-hmm. I will, I'll do like two more pictures just to have their reception yeah. represented because I'm friends with a lot of the DJs and I want them to see like, yeah. you know, to be able to share the party. It's important to them. Right. Um, so I'll do that preview. And then um, when I actually begin to edit the wedding, I take, so I'm this I didn't know this was weird. Again, this, this stems into like me being in my own little world for like 13 years. I love Um, that. I love it. My own little universe. So I don't edit in Lightroom. Never have. It's crazy to me, um, but I love it for you. I love crazy, it. For right? you. I, I, no. you know, it's it's funny because um, everyone's like, "What do you mean?" There's like another <gasps> program, and I'm like, "Well, um, if you're like me and you were never around other photographers, and you know, you didn't know that Lightroom was a thing." So I, when I first started, I believe there was only Photoshop. I could be wrong. Lightroom. Well, I started in 2008, and Lightroom was a thing, but. Okay. Um, but it was new-ish. It was new-ish. But it was um, Creative Suite came out a year after I started. So in 2009, Creative Suite was a thing. Um, but Photoshop was, like, it, all, it almost was like Lightroom was this, like, kind of gimmicky little, like, what's okay. that little program, you know? Because that, make, that makes a little bit more sense. Because yeah. for some reason, when I first started, I got very hung, hung up on Photoshop and yeah. thinking that you had to edit in Photoshop. Right. And, you know... Kelly of whatever, 2011, (laughs) didn't have anybody telling her that this was maybe not the best thing to do. So we just kept on keeping on in there. Um, (laughs) With with our (laughs) HDR. So then, well, I didn't even discover ACR immediately. I was taking every single individual photo into Photoshop, running Photoshop actions, like doing all these things, which was taken forever because the computers back then didn't even like Photoshop. It was like a whole thing. Right, Um, right. So eventually, I just discovered ACR and I was like, oh my gosh, you can actually like batch photos kind of a little bit with this. And it's such a, um, (laughs) I don't want to say such a limited program because it's not anymore. Right. right, Um, but back then, um, you could essentially just like call as you were editing. So it wasn't a second step and it's never been another step for me Mm -hmm. because in ACR and I didn't even realize this until I started to hear about photo mechanic and I looked into it a little bit and why there was a need for photo mechanic because in ACR, you really don't have a need for photo mechanic. Um, Yeah, that's it. That's fascinating. Yeah. So there's really no need because it's not a slow program. So when you pull up and I literally, when I upload my camera, um, 
I take the card off of a card reader. I put it in a folder on my desktop called photos. And then within the folder called photos, I have a, a folder for each wedding that I've photographed, take the, the raw files, put them into that folder. And then I open them with ACR. So there's none of this like importing, exporting. There's right. none of that. It's just, you open them right in there. How, so, how many, are you an overshooter? That's no, a, no. <laughs> so how much would you say you shoot on a, I saw your packages like 10 hour a day. So, think? all right. So it's really funny because I'm going to, I sit here and tell you that I'm not an overshooter, but then I'm like, oh, well, the galleries are like 1800 images. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I, I deliver like 1800 images, but okay. I am an overshooter. Like, okay. All right. Time. So we just have different mental places about yeah. this, but I'm not, I don't think I'm an overshooter because I genuinely will shoot on a single 64 gig card for a wedding and I will not go over. Wow. Now, something to keep in mind. Um, I think it's actually true for the R6 though, too. I think the only time you'd run into trouble with that is if you were shooting an R5 and you were not shooting in compressed raw, you would run over that card really yeah. fast because the yeah. files are gigantic. But yeah. I shoot the R3. So okay. for a full wedding day, um, I can usually get 2,300 images that I've shot on a 64 gig card. It's very rare for me to run over that. Wow. Um, so 2,300 wow. for the whole day? For the whole day from me, yeah. Now that is, yeah. that's fascinating. You know what? I know you mentioned like, I have a plan and like, maybe I'll go into education one day. I'm like, that would be a great course. How to, could you want to know what I'm walking away with? I'm walking away with like 6,000 photos. And, and I, I know it's, it's horrible. Um, but I think part of it also is my personality. Cause I'm just like, oh, I'm getting so excited. I'm just like, you guys look great. And I'm just like, snap, snap, snap. and I'm like, what are you doing? Um, and I know that I could, it's almost like just this rhythm that I've gotten in of not being, it's not even that I'm not intentional. I'm just like, the more that I snap, the more that I see and the more yeah. that I like the creative side, um, comes out. So, but I love that. And that is, that's actually very important for people to hear because you sorting through 2,400, 2,300 photos and delivering 1,800, that, that just, that's a very, that's a third of the time that I'm doing, you know? Yeah. And I mean, so, and it sounds like, uh, it just goes to show you how everybody can approach everything so much differently. Yes. Yes. Um, because I, and I do, I'm like a relatively loose, loose shooter, I say, yeah. Yeah. um, because I definitely like, I clearly care about light. You know, I'm very picky about the light that I'm photographing in, but I will photograph things that are, you know, just happening. Like yes. I do um, yep. candid stuff, but I'm intentional about it. Um, like about what I'm doing. And I think that for the majority of wedding photographers, I think that you are using the most frames during portraits yeah. typically, um, because that's when it becomes the easiest to overshoot. And you know, what's funny, I notice it in my, um, I used to have more second photographers. Now I really only have one. Yes. Um, but I noticed it in seconds because they were delivering more photos than I was. And I was looking <laughs> <laughs> to me. Yeah, yeah. They were giving yeah, me yeah. more. And I'm like, how did you, cause I don't have them photograph family. Right. Um, so I'm like, I photograph like extra parts of this day. Um, buttercup is going crazy. I'm just gonna let her cry it out. Um, okay. I love it. Let her cry it out. out. Like she's a six month old. She knows. Yeah. Oh. She's just, she's not usually like this. I usually it, it will die down and it will stop today. It is just endless. It's um, okay. It's okay. People are getting what they, they're, <laughs> I, I, I appreciate, trying, guys. We're I appreciate trying. your time. I appreciate your time. And I love that buttercup is here. That buttercup is a big part of your life. So this is, she is, she is. I have like an oil painting of her upstairs. <laughs> I mean, we're like out of control here. Um, I love it. We're, we're not out of control, but I, I'll get those photos back from my seconds and be like, Oh my God, the level of overshooting, this is insane. Um, and then I see what they've photographed and uh, a, it's alternate angles. So it's a little bit different just to like look yeah. at anyways, but I can tell, you know, sometimes that they're mostly just shooting and hoping that they get something good in there. Yes. Um, whereas I feel like because I photograph and then edit, so, so incredibly much Yes, that I'm so dialed in to what is going to be something that I'll use, what's going to add to the gallery, what's going to keep the gallery consistent. Yes. Um, you know, and the moments that I need to, like the ones that I need to catch, the ones that are going to be, you know, the best for the gallery. Mm -hmm. Like I'm so dialed in that it's so yes. much easier for me to limit myself when I'm shooting. And it's funny because when I'm actually photographing, I'm not thinking about limiting when I'm photographing. Right. Right. I'm just trying to be as mindful, which I feel like serves me and it serves the couple when I'm photographing 
Um, because I actually thought that filling a whole 64 gig card was quite a lot. Again, mindset where, yes. we, you know, like it's just, it, it's because it, I was in my own bubble. I'm like, oh my gosh, this is, I'm photographing a lot here. This is so many frames. And, and some people hear that. And some people think, I mean, most people do like gasp when I'm like, you, you shot 6,000 photos. Why? <laughs> I'm like, I don't know. But I, I think, don't I don't know why I did that. I was having so much fun. I was yeah. Like, yeah, it was so fun. I, um, but. I think for you, it, what I hear you saying is that the more you do something, you self-optimize. So mm -hmm. like you've naturally self-optimized as you're shooting so that when you are doing the, the editing process, and part of that's also, I know that I just call on the drive home from the wedding and now AI edits in my weddings because I shoot in, I shoot very similarly to you. Like my, my shoot in sections you find the light, you stay there, right? I teach. Yes, that. if it's good, you stay. You don't leave. Yes. Learn that early on. Learn that the hard way many times. Yes. If, if you stay there, though, I mean, AI is amazing with that because you know, my style is very simple. I don't do anything crazy. It's very true to life. So I send it. I drove home from a wedding at the Biltmore, called it on the way home. AI edited it on the way home. So I go home and I have an edited wedding. Is it perfect? Heck no. It's not perfect. I, I got to go tweak some things, especially indoor, which... They're working on that, but it's not there yet. Um, but then I'm just getting ready for the blog, but I'm done. Like, I'm just done. So I think part of my overshooting is because I know that, like, I'll just call through really quick and then, you know, I'm handing that off. But for you, you're like, nope, I'm taking every single image into ACR and I am going to do this myself. So I'm going to optimize on the front end, which is wise. I mean, I could optimize and save myself a lot of time if I took your approach, but your approach has allowed you to find rhythms that serve you better, which I think is mm -hmm. really good for people to hear. And that's not gonna be true for everybody either. Right. Um, you know, if you don't, if you don't photograph that way, if you really are, um, and I'm very moments driven, so it's hard for me to even say that I'm not because yeah. I, I am, you know, I right. absolutely am. But over time, I've even just honed in on the ways that I can photograph like more candid moments in light. That's not optimal, like better, like there's yes. just a way to do it better. Yes. Um, so I know exactly like you know, and I, I, I take a little bit of heat for this, but I love my 50 so, so much. It is my yeah. most favorite lens. I shoot like 90% of my photos with my 50. I rarely take it off my camera. Yeah. Um, I, I actually do not like the 2872. Yeah. I know, I know, my I know. Favorite. <laughs> <laughs> I'm saying, I know, so controversial. Um, so I don't like, I have the lens. I use well, it for massive. Pop. It's massive too big for the R3. It's yes. too big. It's yes. too much. Yeah. Um, and I ridiculous on that. <laughs> oh, it looks absurd. It looks absurd. And then if you put a, a flash on it, it looks oh. like you're carrying like an infant, like it's a little, gonna, and it's going to, it's like a spaceship. It's going to take off. Oh yeah. It's, yeah. It, oh my gosh, my shoulder. No. So yeah. it's too big on there. Yeah. Um, but I uh, j like my shooting, the way that I photograph now, like I've just figured out, I'm very dialed into even how to get like more, you know, candid type of things yeah. in light. That's not so great, but do it in a way that's like as consistent as it can be. Yeah. Um, to keep, cause I, I say there are two of me, there's, there's photographing Kelly and there's editing Kelly. So photographing Kelly really aims to make editing Kelly happy. <laughs> <laughs> I love that. Your split, her. your split personalities are trying yeah. to get along. She thinks of her a lot. She <laughs> thinks of future Kelly very much when she's photographing. I love that so much. I, I mean, honestly, I think that um, this is all so good because what I, th what I hear you saying, and I appreciate this, is that I feel like because of your background, and because your heart for people that I have picked up on just talking to you and, and just hearing more of your story, you go into the day to serve and the artistic side is still a part of it. But because that's not this massive component, like you weren't an artist first that then, I mean, you were, but like artistry is not the ultimate end all be all for you. So that allows you to just shoot with your 50. Cause like for me, I feel like I'm a little bit of a mix. Like I love serving. I love the relationship part. 
Um, but my 85 millimeter, I have to bring it out. It's just magical to me. But that's, that is the artist side of me coming out. Like I want to create something ex very specific and very visual. And for you, I feel like this speaks to why you can do what you can do because shooting with a 50, even just from a physical capacity, like I know you mentioned on the other episode that you are in great shape. Like you could run four miles before a wedding and be fine. That's crazy. A lot of people are like, I shoot one wedding and I can't walk. And you know, I, sometimes I mean, I've shot the last seven years pregnant. So I get that. Oh, but, you're amazing. You're amazing. I know. I, oh, oh no, I, I am. If I, if I was running four miles a day, I would feel, do a lot better on a wedding day, but you're not holding a 28 to 70 on an R6. You're holding a 50 millimeter, right? It makes sense. Even just the, the, the weight and the strain on your hands. You're, I think you're overall, what I'm hearing is like, you've just optimized yourself. You know, I try, you know, and it was, it wasn't necessarily even intentional, which is yeah. funny, Yeah. but when you're doing that much, you just start to figure out like, all right, how can I make this easier, better? And those are the things that I'm going to do. Yeah. Um, and I see a lot in the photo community, especially because, you know, so many of the people who get into this industry are so heavily like arts driven. Yes. Um, so I will see people in groups who are like, oh my gosh, they have all of this equipment that they're bringing and all of this yes, crazy flash, amounts flash things that they're bringing and gels and modifiers and, and all these things. And if that is your style, I've seen beautiful right. work. Do you go for it? Yes. Um, yeah. But, and when I first started funnier still, this is a terrible story, but when I would go to family sessions initially, I would bring everything I had. So I would bring like a tripod <laughs> yeah, I would just bring in case, just in case, just in case, and I wanted to seem super professional, so I had to bring everything. Yes, yes, and then I would use literally just the camera, but I was carrying around all of this stuff on the beach because that's like how I started. So I'm like lugging all this stuff out, oh, the tripods, sand in every crevice. The thing probably couldn't even like have a camera on it. So oh. I bring multiple bags, multiple cameras, all these lenses, a remote trigger. Oh, the things I had in that bag, the like things why, I had in that why bag. Why would you need that? Why would you ever need that? Yeah. <laughs> so, and I thought that made me more professional. Mm -hmm. I was like, oh, if I just bring all these things, they're going to take me more seriously. Look at all the stuff that she has. Yeah. Yes. And now my attitude is I want to carry the least amount of things that I can possibly carry. And that is not even to say I'm actually, I'm very into like backups of backups. Mm -hmm. So in the, in my car, I have another R3, another 50, one, two, another, I mean, we, I have duplicates of the exact gear that I use when I'm photographing, because yeah. if something breaks, I want the exact backup that I have. I don't right. want like something else. Right. Um, I love that. So I have like, oh, it, it just, it's a little sick how many backups of the backups I have. But do you know what is great? And I think hopefully reassuring to people is like, look at you. Like, here's Kelly. She is making over half a million dollars as a wedding photographer shooting, booking over 90 weddings a year. And what she's saying is like, the less gear, the better. The less <laughs> options, the better. The less craziness, the better. Because the truth is your gear is not going to make you book no. any weddings a year. And the truth is, is that nothing beyond the experience really is going to get you to a place where you are. Like you, you have shown up consistently for people day in and day out and serve them really well. And that marketing is tenfold. So that, this is a good question. I, I, I kind of cut you off on your, um, your, your workflow. Um, I told you, I'm like, this might be disorganized, <laughs> um, but your, um, your workflow. Okay. How, how much are you happy to work during the week? Would you say, is it like nine to five hours? Um, it's probably a little bit less than nine to five hours. Yeah. Um, it's, it's usually like 10 to 10 to two. Yeah. Yeah. Great. Um, and I do take some days where I'm not going to do anything like, yes. you know, especially in the summer, that's really my season, um, which is a bit at odds with, you know, weddings, but yes. it is what it is. I signed up for this. Yes. Um, so, but that's, you know, and I take breaks, like I'll go outside, I'll swim, I'll play with the dogs, but I am editing. Um, and I, I do get through a wedding in three to four hours. That's amazing. Um, and it's because in ACR, <laughs> you <laughs> can um, pretty much like batch uh, groups of like, I can do 250 um, and it's heavily dependent on your processor, on your computer at yep. that point. Yes, it is. Be because of how I like, you know, how it, it, it starts to matter. Yes. So I have like a maxed out um, 
Well, I have a Mac, Mac studio up in my office that I don't ever use because <laughs> I prefer to sit on the couch with the dog. So yes, I ignore that machine for the most part. It's but Buttercup. It, that's Buttercup's fault. <laughs> it is. We like to just sit on the couch together. Yeah. So I'm editing on the, the couch with my laptop, which is like a maxed out MacBook, which will get the job done if yes. you, know, you choose to go the route of ACR and you're kind of exporting all those images together. But I'll do batches of like 250 and because they're well shot, I can go through them pretty quickly, make my, you know, honestly, I don't do any extreme editing. There's no, um, I don't really dodge and burn. I don't use very many masks or layers or anything like that. Like it's very straightforward. Right. Um, go through, edit them. There's a script that I run that will save them all down to JPEG in a new folder within my photos folder that has the folder for the wedding in it. So then there's like a new photo, a new folder that has like, you know, the name mm -hmm. of the wedding, all the finished yep. JPEGs in it. Um, but I'll save down those 250 and then I'll just go get another 250. And, you know, each batch of 250 can take me anywhere from maybe like 15 minutes mm -hmm. to maybe like 20, 25 minutes, depending upon what part of the wow. day it is, right. the day that it was. Um, so it goes very quickly, you know, yeah. like yeah. in essentially an hour, I can have half of a wedding done, um, right. like no problem. And it wasn't really that much of a heartache to do. Like I'm, you know, I have my, whatever I'm watching at that moment, you know, yeah. love is blind or whatever yeah. it is that's on television. Um, as I'm going through, yeah. so it's not really so, so bad. Right. Um, but, and is that for everybody? I don't know. Maybe. <laughs> well, it could be, I think I think it's for people who have the capacity to do it. And, you know, for you, I, I think that, like, your life allows for that. And that is wonderful. And I think that, like, you having the control over your edits is something that means a lot to you. And, like, sure. Like, if you, if you were coming in and complaining of, like, I'm drowning, I'm drowning, it's like, well, hello. <laughs> majority of people, I would say most people at your level um, have, I mean, one of the questions that I have on, it's like, what, how many are people are on her staff team? <laughs> and I'm like, I, I don't think, you know what? I think you've got the wrong idea. Um, and so I think a lot of people are just baffled by this because it is such a high, high number of weddings, but I think they have to know the full picture. You have optimized yourself in an incredible way. Service comes first before artistry, which helps with that optimization. You also have a system that works for you with editing. A lot of what you're saying Lightroom does too, but if you love ACR, like you gotta do what, you gotta do what works for you. And, and I have used Light, so I have used Lightroom. Yes, you're like, I don't love that thing. I didn't love, you know what, what was funny about it? So um, it's actually, it's so similar to ACR. It's like laughable because if you use ACR, like you can use Lightroom and vice versa, they yes. are the same. Yes. Um, the only thing that I noticed was that Lightroom was slower Mm. just in um, like how it functioned and you can't call first. You, you can't call in Lightroom. You have to call first. Um, well, you could, but it would be real slow. I think what, it's real slow. Right. And then you could, you could like, I, yeah, I take that back. You could, the way that I call, you could do it in Lightroom, but I think it would be really hard. Mm. Like it just seemed hard. Um, but aside from that, the, every other, and they've beefed up bridge as the years have, um, yes, ACR, have. I, keep on, I use the words bridge and ACR interchangeably, but they're different. Um, it's yes. technically they're different, but, yes. um, like they, they've beefed it up enough where you can do, um, they even have some AI, um, like you can do yeah. AI presets in there. Now you can do a lot of masking. You can do, um, like healing and cloning, which was something that you never used to be able to do. So right. in the past I used to have to take, if I had had to clone something out or, um, do something like yeah. that, I would have to bring into Photoshop and then save it down from there. Mm -hmm. And that's not even true anymore. Although I will say that ACR, the cloning is not as good. It's a little confusing. I don't know why that is, but it is. <laughs> um. <laughs> but, I think, but I think overall, what I hope people hear this is freedom, like freedom to mm -hmm. figure out what works for you. And like, you are not, I, I know you mentioned in Kyle's episode, like there's just not this magic thing that these people think they're missing out on. I think people are worried that like, oh, she's got the magic golden ticket and I didn't get it and I missed the boat. I, please interview her so I can figure out how I missed the boat. And the truth is, is that you've shown up consistently. It's the same thing when people are like, how did you lose 100 pounds? How did you do? No way you didn't have surgery. Like, no way you didn't. Like, how? there's no way. 
But people, what people don't recognize that like showing up consistently and having the discipline to stick with a pattern and a flow, like that's how I built this, right? I, people would say, uh, I'm, I'm doing all this stuff for educators, like uh, all, it's 25 of them. It's not like this huge group, <laughs> but they're talking about how did you grow this tribe of people that will learn from you? And I'm like, you know what I did? I gave them free content for eight years. <laughs> Every day for eight yes. years, I gave and I gave and I gave. You are serving and you're serving and you're serving and you have this system that you're using and people, it's working. I think people just need the freedom to know like she's made it her own, she's optimized it, she approaches things differently. And the biggest thing, biggest takeaway, you've put your head down and you got away from the noise. I think that that is huge. Yes. Oh, it made a huge, it made a huge difference. Um, just because I... Um, and I do really believe that comparison is the thief of joy. Yes. So I didn't have where I was constantly, you know, comparing myself to other people because I didn't even know there were other people, um, for a long, <laughs> for a long, for a long time. Um, and it just, you know, like looking back, it, it was, it was a big part of my story yeah. because every single part of my business was developed just kind of like out of necessity out of what was strictly working. So I didn't have, um, and I, it, for better or worse in the industry, I think there's a lot of, um, there's a lot of good information, but there's also a lot of good information that has been misconstrued yes. and then gets like propagated, yes. <laughs> um, like repetitively because it's not a one size fits all. Right. And you have to have context for any of this, like good information in order to apply it, you know, appropriately. But for me, it just was really like sink or swim. And you're going to have to figure out what the good information is in order to be able to like further your business. Otherwise, yeah. it's going to fail. And those years, like the rough years when things were a little bit dicey, um, was when I was figuring it out. Um, yeah. Yeah. Like I, I was really figuring it out and I was struggling for, uh, you know, a little bit there just because, you know, you think, oh, well, I'm doing but better. I was booking better. You know, the trajectory now is going to be all up from here. Right. Um, and that was not the case. Right. Uh, I had to, you know, there were things I had really had to get my branding together. I was all over the place. Um, it was like, I had a, a different like business name that was really a lot more landscape oriented mm -hmm. that wasn't going to sell weddings. Right. And I had to be honest with myself about that. Yes. Um, you know, it was just never going to work. Right. It was just never going to work. So yeah. I had to really strategically, um, you know, plan what was going to be marketable. What was I going to be able to do? Like what shooting style made me happy, but was also going to be marketable. Yes. Um, you know, there were a lot of decisions that I made at that point that changed things, but, mm -hmm. and it was hard. Like it was really hard to be honest with myself and be like, you're not yeah. doing so well. Right. Um, <laughs> and, so, and to believe that I think a lot of people with the, the pressure of the world, the anxiety of the world and like not taking their thoughts, thoughts captive when it, when like the overwhelm creeps in, they really start to believe that like, this is a sign I can't do this. You know, and they yeah, that's not true. There. It's not right. true at all. Um, like your, your opportunity is lying in the fact that you're not doing well. Like it was yeah. hard for you, but you said, I'm not, I'm not doing well, but what did that lead you to? You figured your stuff out. So I think people get stuck. I even wrote down, like, I think people get so stuck in this. And I actually, I have some questions that I wanted to like speak to. We're kind of, um, do some stuff for beginners in the next few weeks. Um, and so I want to speak to them because what you're doing seems so beyond what they could ever accomplish. And I think people get stuck at this level of, um, it's not going well for me. Look at everyone else. The, the more that we default to looking at everyone else, which is what we do when we can't figure something out. Like if I don't know what to do next on writing a sales email and I'm just so over it, guess what I do on, on default? I just start calling <laughs> and I'll see someone else's and I'll do, and, and that completely derails me and that's not helpful. So yes. you are proof that putting your head down, you aren't even aware that there were other people and look what has happened to your business. That's incredible, right? Um, so my question, I, I have a few of these and you can make them kind of fast if you, if you want to. Well, I'll try. I'll totally try. Okay. I can, I, I'm so easy to like off track. It's terrible. Oh. It's so terrible. If you can't tell, so am I. So great. <laughs> um, and also Tyler's going to kill me because my camera's never straight. Okay. But, um, so if someone is shooting their first wedding, they, they just did one wedding. They want to make this, this a career. 
if you could like take what you've learned, like the 2016 to 2017 turnaround for year for you, what would you say to somebody who is like, I just did one wedding. I love this stuff. How do I make it a career? Like, what would you say a best practice would be? Photograph as much as you can photograph. Yeah. Um, and this is unpopular, but I was very into when I first started photographing in any way that I possibly can, even if that meant that I was unpaid or yeah. paid more than I should have been worth at that time. Same. Um, there's a big emphasis on like, uh, knowing what you should be worth now. Um, and I don't want to say like, don't you, your time is, your time yeah. is worth something. But sometimes you have to make a sacrifice when you're starting your snowball, because when you're so new, especially in weddings, especially in weddings, because the stakes are so, so, so high, yes. um, they're not going to trust you immediately if you've only photographed like one thing. Right. Um, so the more that you can photograph, the more, like the better off that you're going to be. So when I was first starting, I was like, I, that, that second wedding that I photographed yes. was, I was going to be a bridesmaid. Like I went and was like, Hey Michelle, like I'm going to photograph you at your yes. wedding surprise. Um, let's go out on the golf course for a little bit. Um, you know, clearly I didn't charge her anything for that, but I didn't feel like I was even worth charging for quite a while yeah. because I was genuinely worried that I was going to mess things up. And I was like, well, the easiest way you know, if I should mess this up, cause there was a real chance that I might have, right. um, and Lord knows I did a little bit there, but, um, that's why I didn't take money for a, a while until right. I felt confident in what I was doing. Um, just because I wanted to be transparent that I was not very good. Um, right. 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 So I, I was I think not that's very a, good. Well, I um, think that's a gift for people to, to be able to you know, just hear that, like, it's okay. You're not going to be good at first. No, oh, you're is. not. I was legitimately like terrible. Um, <laughs> hey, legitimately, well, like not very good at all. Um, yeah. But, and I think like now what I see a lot of is people who are very early in their career. Um, and they, they want, they're, they're around people who are further along in their career. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, and there's a, there's always going to be a big difference there because right. you can't do the same things if at the beginning of your career that you can when you're much further along. Right. So right. there's like a disconnect between like what you're, what you're going to be able to do in the beginning versus what you're going to like the advice that's going to be good for you later on. Yeah. Um, and exactly. a lot of the pricing advice and stuff, you know, people who are beginners are, are finding that type of pricing advice and thinking that they can immediately apply it, mm -hmm. but you're not going to be able to apply that until, you know, there are a bunch of other pieces in your business that have all fit together. Yes. Um, but I, my best advice, just photograph as much as you can photograph people that will let you photograph them and, you know, grow in that grow yes. when the stakes are really low and you're able to just hone your craft. Yes. Like that is going to be the best. Failed, <laughs> failed cheaply. Like the school that we started, we always talk about, like, we want our children to fail cheaply at things early mm -hmm. in their life because then when they, they, they learn how to fail well, you know? Yes. Um, and so I love that. I, I remember going to, when I first started, my husband and I went to someone's wedding that I was not the photographer at. And I was the annoying person. I was like the uncle Bob. I took pictures of, I took a picture of their cake. I took a picture of them dancing and I took a picture of them during the ceremony and I blogged it. I was like, oh, what? oh gosh, Caitlin. But you know what I was doing? That was the hustle. That was like, if I have a moment where I could capture something to show content, I'm mm -hmm. going to do it. And there's, there's, a beauty in that if people could see it there's a beauty in that like the really like looking for any way to grow this business um okay i another question and i know we're getting <laughs> we've been doing this for a while uh, almost <laughs> done um would you say when you started and the 2016 year you're really getting the hang of it do you feel like your focus is more on technical development or client experience development? Like, were you going into weddings being like, gosh, I want to make them feel awesome. I know I got to work on my manual shooting or my posing, but like they come first. What do, what do you think that? I have what? always put them first. Yeah. Always, always, Me always too. put them first. Um, even when my technical skill was lackluster, I was still putting the couple first and then really hoping that I could catch up yeah. <laughs> um, with the yeah. technical side. Yeah. So the technical stuff, I feel like I started to get, um, and my, my sweet friend, Dorothy, she probably, she's not a photographer. She probably won't listen to this. Um, but I would take Dorothy out. I, one of my favorite, I think the turning point for me was I had taken Dorothy 
um, she's wonderful. So she had gone and gotten like her makeup done by another friend of ours, like her hair done. She had this really adorable dress and I really wanted to go and do pictures in, um, like bloom season, which in New Jersey Mm -hmm. is a a very short window (laughs) that, uh, falls at a random time in like April. Uh, so fortunately we, you know, managed to kind of catch this and I had just really wanted to, you know, photograph her the way that I wanted to photograph going forwards. And she was willing to give me like two hours of her time. We drove all over like our area. Um, at one point, some of the most Maybe. favorite photos that I took of her, I had put her in these, oh my gosh, they're yellow flowers. I cannot think of whatever. It's a yellow bush, yellow flowers. And yeah, I, yes. It was at like an abandoned house that no one was living at. I put her like in, cause there was just an abundance of them yes. and I photographed her in there. They'd actually got published, which is so wild. It is. Um, <laughs> I love but it. She let me just have this evening where I was like, I'm going to figure this out as best I can figure it out. Um, and I felt like that particular day, cause when I looked at them, they looked so different from the work that I had been doing. And it was just like an evening where I really got to try, try things and, you know, work on some of the things that I had been reading about or looking at in terms of my camera and shooting in manual. Right. I think that was the first time that I had shot like fully manual mm. with my camera. And that was like, you know, the game night changer. That, yep, it was a game changer. That was like the night that it happened. Yeah. Um, and I remember looking at the photos and being like, this is like, worlds different than what I have been doing. And this is what I like, like that kind of just set me on fire, like looking at what I had produced. Mm -hmm. Um, I love that. And it just changed like that night, you know, changed the, it changed my game. And then the next time that I went into a wedding, I felt so much more confident and comfortable that it was so much easier for me to like, even just serve my couple because I had more confidence with what I was using. And now the gear and all that is so secondary to what I'm doing. Like, yes, it's just, it's so secondary at this point. What would you you say helped you? Did you do a course? Did you just study yourself? Cause I mean, for me, when I started in 20 or 2008, there were no courses. Like if you wanted to create a certain look, you have to trial and Mm -hmm. error the crap out of whatever you're shooting to figure out how do I get what I want? So how that was exactly it. Yeah, Yeah. that was exactly it. Cause there wasn't, this was, you know, 2011, I'm sorry. And not 2011, 20, this was 2016. Like this was the year that things changed for me, but there still wasn't, um, I feel like just the attitude back then wasn't like, Oh, we'll just look it up on YouTube. Oh yeah. No, Um, no. I don't even think I found you. The reason that I even found you. Yeah. I don't even know how you found me. You were just, it was because of all access. And I was like, Oh my gosh, I have never seen anyone else photograph a wedding from like a photographer perspective. Like I need to see this. Um, so whatever, I don't think I did it the first year. I maybe found it like your second year. I, Yes, I don't 20, you would, 2018, you would 2018, I think. My team so, my team looked it up and I'm just like, oh, she's a long time veteran. I love it. <laughs> but it was so comforting. Um, you have the most soothing voice in the first place. Oh, but so but watching you and like seeing you go through the same struggles mm-hmm. that I was experiencing was so comforting because I was like, oh, this doesn't only happen to me. Like yes. this worry that I'm you know, not making the best location choice or, um, you know, this challenge with like, where am I going to put these details or how am I going to do this? Like there, she experiences this too. Um, and because I had never worked underneath anybody else, like I, I think over the entire course of my career, I have second shot maybe five times. Um, and they were people like one of my very, very best friends, Courtney. Hi, Courtney. I love you. Um, so I had the way that I met Courtney is really funny and I won't tell the whole story, but, um, she was just starting photography when I had first met her. So I like, I, (laughs) I genuinely don't feel like I had like taught her that much. I think she's very naturally talented and she's amazing. Like she has an incredible life story. Um, but you know, I had second photographed for her. So of course, because we were close, we do a lot of things very similarly. Yeah. So it felt like, you know, we're together, like we were doing a lot of the same things. Right. And that's really like the only second shooting experience that I had was going with somebody who was like a really good friend, knowing that we do so many of the same things together, that's you know, cause amazing. she had, she had shot for me a bunch. Like, th- so seeing somebody that was totally like out of my circle, yes. you know, going through the exact same things, it was so comforting. Um, yeah, that's, it, it, that's yeah. so awesome because, you know, for me, 
I I love that you also you weren't brand new. You know, we sometimes pitch all access as like this is a great way to gain experience as a second shooter, but like we also have a lot of people who dive into all access who have been shooting for a while that just need to see someone else like, oh, that's how she does that. Like mm-hmm. I maybe I like my way better, but it's good to see her do it. Or it's good to see her most people say most people say, I love it when you make a mistake. And I'm like, <laughs> great. I'm happy to make a mistake on camera for you because I do think people, there's, there's no other way to grow like that. You know, yeah. you know, p- courses are polished. Like they're, they're the best of the best and you're yes. not going to see someone make a whoopsie. But, um, so I love that. And I, okay, I have one more beginner question and then we'll uh, wrap this up. But, um, would you say to someone who is just getting started, the barrier of entry as a photographer is incredibly low. Like yeah. the, it, it is, I, my brother just started a business. Um, he's doing like um, pond management. He has a $200,000 um, amphibious machine that he had to buy from the Ukraine. Like <laughs> crazy. Oh, I believe it. I believe it. Yeah. So, so I'm listening to him talk about the startup cost of a business. And I'm like, what we do is not hard. Like it is yeah. not hard. So why do so many beginners struggle? To, to, to make it happen. Why do you think? I, I mean, we, we were talking about it. I think there's just so much noise, um, yeah. Yeah. in the industry that it, and there's no one way to do things. I even tell this, um, to couples, like when they, if we do a call and they, ah! they confirm this to me that there's no baseline. So when you're looking for a photographer, mm-hmm. even as a couple, there's no real baseline. Yeah. It's not like, ah! Oh, well, you know, the barrier to entry, like everybody's going to have like this camera and they're going to shoot in this way. And you're going to get this from them. Like that is not what is true in this industry. And it's also true when you're learning. Yes. So it true. can be so all over the place. And now because of social media, because of Instagram, because of TikTok, because of all these things, you're going to get so much messaging from so many different people, so many educators, so many people who are, you know, selling this course, that course, that you almost get ahead of yourself before you're able to like dial into like the foundational things of your business. Yes. Um, so and find you, like, who are you yeah, and find as what a your, owner? Yeah. Like what you want to photograph and you know, how you feel about everything. So I just feel like there's so much noise and there's just so much out there, mm-hmm. um, yes. that it's very hard. And again, with the comparisons, because you're going to see, you know, work from people that are 10 years along in their career yes. and you know, you're going to want to produce that, which I wasn't really seeing that in 20, you know, 11, it no. just, wasn't that much. Um, like I would see some semi-local photographers and I would stumble upon their websites, but it is nothing like the level that you see now. Yes. Like if you, you know, go on Instagram, you're seeing, you know, all of this gorgeous work from people who have been, you know, photographing yes. for a while. Yes. And, you know, you put unnecessary pressure on yourself and just, I, I think and you, you get, follow the path of like, I love what you yes. said in Kyle's episode of like, I never wanted to go shoot at a workshop at Lake Como. It's like, it never right. went. <laughs> right? Like, I, I mean, I did get to shoot a wedding in Lake Como. Wow. I, mean, I could have retired after it. I was so happy with the images. <laughs> but, but I will also say that, like, you're right. The, there's so many people following trends and trying to let other yes. people make decisions for them. Yeah. Where it, your experience, what I, I love the most about your story is that you just decided to do your thing and make this thing your own. And it has served you so well to like, to really forge your own path. And so, um, and you don't have time to even notice that other people are on the path with you because you're like, my, my vision's straightforward, you know? Yeah. And I tell people too, like, I am realistic about how I built this business and how things, um, you know, like how I do things. So I don't think in any realistic sense that I can do what I'm doing for, yeah. you know, 15 years. I that was good. That was a question I had. What yeah, do you I don't think plan? That. <laughs> yeah, I don't think that at all. Um, I do think to some degree wedding photography is a limited career window. Mm-hmm. And that's just me being realistic, having seen this industry. Mm-hmm. Um, and because it is so trends focused and people who are like really up to like the trends are usually younger. I already feel old. not old. <laughs> little old, little bit old. Um, but you know, my clients are younger and they're staying the same age and I am getting older. So, um, you know, I was talking to one of my very good, another one of my very good friends. Um, and he is older and he, 
you know, it was a very, he, he worried that he was going to, you know, essentially ah. age out of the industry and not have anything in common with his couples. And he said, it's, it's real. Like it, mm-hmm. it is happening, um, just because of my age. And I, ah. you know, have tried to be realistic about that. So I was like, I don't know that I'll be able to be in this industry in the capacity that I'm in mm-hmm. for another 15 or 20 years. So while I'm able to do this, you know, I probably, I'm just going to go for it. Um, you know, as, as much as I can, and I will build my business, I will set myself up financially. And then if I want to really pull back, you know, and I think I can book five weddings at much Mm -hmm. higher price points, or, you know, if I wanted to transition and do something educational based on like what I've learned in a million weddings, um, I'll be able to do that at that point. But I saw the opportunity to financially, you know, really take care of what I had to take care of. Yes quickly. Um, and just knowing that my time in the industry was going to be limited as it was, um, I am willing to do, you know, the hard work up front. I have this opportunity now. I don't want to squander it. Um, and I, I I decided that I was going to go for it. Um, yeah, I, I think what I love about that is that you see the big picture of like, yeah, I'm not going to be a 55 year old nope. doing 90 <laughs> weddings a year. No. Um, and so, you know, whether you have debt to pay off or a house to pay off or a second house to buy or retirement that you want to, you know, bulk up during these crazy years, like it's a, it's really, I mean, we did the same thing. I started, I, I had my first baby at 29 and all my college roommates started having babies five years earlier. And I'm like, well, I'm real behind the times, but, <laughs> but I, but it was intentional for me because I knew like I, I'm the hustle phase was then. And like, mm-hmm. now I'm in an interesting phase because I'm, I'm, I'm educating and I love it. We built, we built that at a good season. Um, but I am 36 and my clients are sometimes 26 and I'm like, Oh my gosh, you were born in like the mid two thousands. What? It's scary. I know it's I was, scary. I was born I in 87. Like yeah, I don't want to know a lot of times. I genuinely don't want to know. Um, and I feel like I still, because I'm very fortunate, I'm still very much relating to the people who book me. Mm-hmm. Um yeah. You know, and I'm open about my age. It is what it is. Yeah. But, you know, that's only going to, I'm afraid, I don't know. Like, you know, when I'm 45, like, will it still be quite the same? I, I don't know. I really don't know. Well, you're also a young 38. You don't look, you don't look like, oh my gosh, she looks like she's really 48. Like, no, like you're, but I, I think all young. Like, weddings are keeping me young. Yeah. Well, I feel like also if you have a tribe mentality to your brand, Um, there are, I just got an email. This is, I haven't actually shared this publicly. I just got an email from someone who is the son of someone who I shot a wedding 15 years ago. Oh my God. It was a second marriage for them so that he was, you know, at the wedding. Um, but he was a young child at the wedding. He was like, like the, the ring bearer. And now he's inquiring for you shot my dad's wedding. And I'm like, Oh, oh my God. <laughs> I just had this moment of like, I'm at that place. People are, you know, yeah. but I, I also think like such is life. Like it's just, it's just a different season of life. And I love that you're thinking a big picture and that, you know, like things are going to change in the future. So let's take advantage of what I have now, which makes sense. Why you shoot 90 and maybe who knows in like three years, you might be like, yeah, I don't want to do 90, but I think I could make a hundred thousand more if I just took 15 weddings away, but I cranked my prices up. You know, you are, you are in a really cool place because you could book 40 weddings, which is full time for most people at your current price point, And then play like, uh, almost like experiments with the second 40, you know, you could just see what the world happens. Like I'm going to, I'm going to raise my prices and see what the, what the trial and error would be, but I just booked out an entire year. Most people will be thrilled with that. Is you just have so much flexibility. I feel like it's some crazy. people. Yeah, it's crazy. Yes, it's, but, and I will say this too because I think this is important. So one of the pillars of my business has always been being extremely transparent. Yes. Um. So I have always had my pricing publicly and completely on my website. So it is there. It is very obvious. I, it's not hidden. It's literally on the weddings page. Now I used to have like a an, an, uh, separate pricing page, but when right. I had it rebranding, rebranded, they put it on the weddings page, which is fine. I yeah. think a lot of people to be, con- to be transparent, were confused about investment. Some people thought, which you would think th- that would be very straightforward, right. but it just goes to show you when couples are inquiring, how confusing this entire industry 
is. Yes. yes. So yes. they didn't understand that the investment page was where the pricing was. I get it. <laughs> yes. So it's on the. <laughs> we want to sound so fancy. We put investment and they're like, they're I, what? In property? I don't know. They think they're going to buy my stock. I don't yes. have any stock. Right. Um, right. So it's on the weddings page now. Yep. Um, but I keep it there and I keep it obvious because one of the easiest ways that I can build trust with a couple is to have upfront transparent pricing. And I have Mm -hmm. a lot of people that tell me how appreciated that is. Um, and I do it because a, I don't want to waste their time. B, I don't want them to waste my time. Yes. Yes. Um, C, I'm really not that great at selling, nor do I want to sell. So I don't feel like after, you know, if we're going to do a call, I don't have this whole, magical sales conversion that I do. Um, you know, I'm going to talk to them just like I'm like, just like this. Yes. Um, and if we get along, that's going to be great, Yes. but I don't have like a whole sales thing where I'm going to show them my value or, you know, do any of that afterwards. So I always have worried that if I, cause I'm so transparent about the pricing that if I have the pricing up and then one day halfway through the year, I dramatically change it. And then I put it back. I feel like my couples have enough awareness where they would Mm -hmm. see that and there would almost feel like there was some sort of um, like almost like a bait and switch type of a situation Mm -hmm. that was happening. So it's something that I have always considered just Mm -hmm. their perception because pricing in the wedding industry is such a difficult topic to begin with. It's such a touchy subject. Yes. Um, So I have just, and this goes against what a lot of people teach. They teach like, don't put your pricing on the site or only put, you know, something um, like the starting price on the site. And then, you know, you can show your value later, but I have found it so much more beneficial that they Mm -hmm. know all the information up front, they're educated up front. And then, you know, they can make a decision if Mm -hmm. this is in their budget range, because I don't think that it behooves anybody um, if you get a couple with like, you know, just for an example, a thousand dollar budget and you start at $5,000, right. Do I think that it behooves either party to talk a thousand dollar couple up to a $5,000 price point? I don't, I don't know. Right. Right. Um, <laughs> well, I, but, I, think, I think that is a good point of, um, cause I, you know, I do tell people somewhat people that don't have volume like you. And they're not even getting chances to talk to people. Mm -hmm. Some of them, they need to say, they need to leave a little bit to be discovered because they just need a reason to get people in their inbox. But at your level, a hundred percent, I used, I have had seasons where I've done the same thing. I'm like, I don't want an email asking me about the KJ wedding experience. Let's just put it on the website, you know? Um, So I get that. It makes total total sense for where you are. And that's a great example. Like even what we just talked about of where, you know, that advice is specific to like a very, like to a particular part of your career. So it's not necessarily like, you know, there's this way to do it and that's the way you absolutely have to do it. Exactly. It's, it's, you know, you have to look at all these different paths and you Mm -hmm. have to decide for yourself, like, okay, like what is most applicable? What is going to work Mm -hmm. the best in my circumstance? Like what are the, the pain points that I'm seeing in my business? Like what can help me overcome? come those things. Right. Right. Um, and when people see that you put everything out there and they're like, oh, well, Caitlin says not to I'm like, right. But look at Kelly's situation, right? Like if you are in, if you're, if you are bringing in all these inquiries and booking 20, 40 weddings a year and you can't keep up with your email, well, then that's a great example that you need to vet these people and give them all the information on the front end like Kelly does because it's going to save your workflow. You're going to make sure people really want you and you're not making them guess. But before we had you guess it, making them guess a little bit because you just needed a chance to get in front of them. They were just bypassing you and you didn't get a chance. So I do. I, that's great advice to tell people like analyze where you are and and wh- what that person is teaching and making sure that like it aligns with your season of business because if it doesn't then it's really bad advice mm-hmm. you know it's not going to serve you well so i i love that i love what you're doing and i think it's such a good reminder to people in a season where a lot of people are struggling to book that like you putting your head down and doing the hard work and really showing up for people and serving them there's no magic button that gets you around that you right. You have Absolutely. to show up that way. Yeah. So, but I um okay. We've been talking for so long, and I'm sure people always say like, Caitlin, I'd love do a three hour podcast. And I'm like, I'll never do that. But this one will be a long one. Um, I I think I you know I have this whole list of things, but we covered a lot, and I'm very grateful for your time, and I'm very excited for you in the future when you decide that Buttercup needs you more at home. <laughs> 
<laughs> that you'd want to do education and help people understand how you've done this. I think that there's just a lot of beauty in, in really breaking down how you've made this happen for yourself. And so um, thank you for being willing to do this. Oh my goodness. Thank you so much for having me. I I was almost like, oh my gosh, I don't have anything worthwhile you do. to say. You do. <laughs> well, I think, uh, you know, I, I teach so much about the KJ tribe and, and serving and building and like so much of that fits into this. But I my favorite part about this was just hearing how you have, you do it so much and so often that you've optimized your reality as a wedding photographer. And people need to hear that stuff because like your life's getting easier the more that you do it because you're realizing like, yeah, I'm going to shoot thinking about Kelly number one. <laughs> editing Kelly needs shooting Kelly to behave. Yes. Think of think of editing. Thank yes. editing Kelly. Yes. Um, so but no, thank I you, Kelly. Oh, I'm and I it, it's so helpful. So helpful. I oh, I'm glad. I, I was worried. I was legitimately worried that um because I don't think I'm like that interesting. So I even when Kyle had I was like, are you really sure that you want to do this? Because yes. I'm just gonna like A, the dogs are gonna be barking the whole time. Um <laughs> B, like I don't know that I have anything crazy to say. Um, because it's not magical advice. It's really just like, yeah, like it was a lot of time and it was a lot of effort and you know, it was a lot of hustle, but it paid off. Yes. Um, yes. And not the advice people want, but it is, that's the reality. Well, um, and it's, it's helpful for people to hear the realities of someone who's doing what they, they say they, at least not, I don't think everyone wants 90 weddings, but I think a no. lot of people want to just be booked and yes. your, your, story is just proof of what I think a lot of people are saying that like you, you do the hard work and the work will come. And I, anyway, I just appreciate your time because I know uh, you may not have shot weddings this past weekend, but you got a lot coming <laughs> and coming. Your, time, your time is so valuable. So I know that you are so seriously, Caitlin, thank you. I can't thank you enough. This was so special. Um, oh. and I hope that it benefited your KJ tribe. I hope that it didn't terrify them. I, don't want anybody to think that, you know, if you don't shoot X, Y, Z amount of weddings, like you're less than, or you're no. not as good, or it's, it's so much, none of that. And no, I think no. that that, you know, ends up being part of that, like comparison and people see like, Oh, you're working and I'm not. And that means like, I'm, you know, less than, and that is not, it is no. so, so, so not the case. Um, and that's and their decision. They got to choose to believe that for themselves, you know? Yes, yeah. absolutely. And, you know, just because this is how I'm operating, does not mean that that's how someone else has to operate. I think that's, you know, there's so many, so many ways to do this. Yeah. So, so, so many ways to do so, this. So I freedom. just wanted to present, even when I like first had like posted about this, um, I just wanted to present like a different, there's a different way mm -hmm. that you can do this. Yes. Um, because that's it, not necessarily what you see. I think there are others of me who are just very quiet. Um, people who do similar things that are just very, very quiet. I think nice. they're out there. I'm actually in a group with like two others of them who are from different countries. Wow. Um, so there are others. They just, we just tend to be a little bit quieter, but we, we do exist. Um, you, you don't have time to be loud. <laughs> <laughs> we just tend to be a little quieter, but um, it's been really fun being able to talk about it a little bit. So, Yay. so much appreciation for you taking your time too. Yeah. Um, this was amazing. And like, thank you so, so much. So it was welcome. so nice to actually get to talk to you like live and meet you in person. I know. I know. Well, it's fun for me because I, I interview a lot of people. Well, I don't interview a lot of people. When I do, it's a lot of time peers from, and they've, they've moved on. They're not even in the photography industry. It's fun to talk to someone who is, you know, technically in our KJ student world, right? You're, I found you in our education group and to be able to really talk at a level of like that everyone in that group is trying to make this happen in real time and I'm shoot I'm one of the ones like I shoot four weddings a year right now so I'm I'm one of the ones that like has remind myself I'm still a wedding photographer even though I'm not shooting 48 and the, what you I I got a lot of inspiration from what you shared and so grateful for you grateful for buttercup I'm so glad that she joined us <laughs>